Can yeah. you imagine how setting a goal can set you apart? Mm. You know, I didn't I didn't wake up one day and say, I'm gonna run a marathon. <laughs> right. You know, and but I will tell you on that process, I wasn't really going to run a marathon until I told somebody I was gonna run a marathon. Yes. You know, it was part of that that goal setting process. So going back to your question, I think if you are, if you set goals and you're persistent, I think a lot of things fall into place, whether you're a optimist or a pessimist, right. setting goals and being persistent. Welcome to the Audacious Living Podcast, hosted by my man, Audley Stevenson, the odd man. Greetings and salutations. Welcome to the Audacious Living Podcast, where our goal is to inspire and empower our listeners to live their most and best audacious lives ever. It's always a pleasure to have you here, and I appreciate each and every one of you for taking time out of your day to join us. You know, just like a, a sculptor who takes responsibility for chiseling away at a block of marble, shaping into a masterpiece, we too must take responsibility for our actions by learning from our mistakes, embracing challenges, and persisting towards our goals. We can sculpt our lives into works of arts. Now, Edward Doherty is a seasoned motivational speaker and success coach with years of experience helping individuals unlock their full potential. His unique approach to goal setting and persistence has transformed the lives of many. Now, in this episode, Edward shares his insights on the importance of persistence and goal setting and emphasize the need to take responsibility for our actions and learn from our experiences. You'll also hear about his own audacious tale through some of his personal stories. So now that what you all set, let's turn our t- over our let's turn our attention over to our conversation with Edward. Enjoy. Hey Ed, thank you for joining me here today on the Audacious Living Podcast. I uh, appreciate you making for to, for making the time like this. Thank you. Well, I'm I'm excited to be here. You you are more audacious than I am, but uh, <laughs> philosophically, I think we're brothers. Absolutely. Listen, I I yeah. I mean, I just kind of moved through this world as I believe I was meant to. Quite frankly, Ed. Like, I mean, um, I truly believe that we've all got our own purpose, our own path, uh, and it's incumbent on us to live that and be that, be that individual we're supposed to be. Um, you know, I too can- often. Was go, say, go ahead. I was going to say I couldn't agree more. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Like you too. never know the impact of what you do. Could take years, but someone might be inspired by your conversation with them, and it could change their life. Well, I will give you a quick story. I heard this not too all that long ago, and it's and it stayed with me. A friend of mine who, um, uh, she is a professional accountant. Right, went to school for many years to get her certification. Works in corporate world and 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 that's the space that she's in and one day her and i were talking and she was uh just expressing just not being fulfilled not being happy yes this is what her career is yes this is what she studied yes this is what she thought she wanted to do with the rest of her life and she realized that she doesn't and and through this conversation um she told me about a young woman that she doesn't know personally but heard of and this young woman that she knew of um, also was an accountant and also worked in the corporate field and also wasn't happy or fulfilled. <laughs> and that individual decided that they were going to leave the corporate world and focus on working on small businesses and, and, and not-for-profit organizations. And she's working in that space, helping them build their own infrastructure, helping them strengthen themselves, helping them to, to operate better um, administratively, if you will. And she has so much happiness and fulfillment in that. And I will tell you, the woman that, so I'm, I'm hearing a story of other woman. That woman has no idea that her life, because she's living it to be happy, right? She lived it to be happy. She left her corporate job to be happy. She has no idea that my friend has found inspiration from her simply yeah. through her actions. Yeah. Nor does she know I'm telling that very same story on my podcast. Yeah, right. Right? So it's incumbent on us 
to be who we're supposed to be, if it's something that we are driven towards, um, I, I mean, it could be a whole host of things. The bottom line is, is take that step forward, muster up the courage and boldness and take that audacious step. And so there you go. Throw a pebble into a pond and it ripples. There we go. There we go. Now, I don't know what we're here to talk about because we just went on a tangent <laughs> off the top, but I wanted to give you the opportunity, Ed, uh, to let the audience a little bit about yourself because you've got uh, a, a, an incredible story really around not waiting. Like, you know, it's never too late to do anything. You can accomplish anything you want anytime you want. You got to take that action. It's certainly what you did, but maybe you can let our audience know a little bit about you and what you do. Sure. I, I'm, I'm turning 73 this month. Congratulations. And I ran my first marathon at the age of 70. And I published my first book at the age of 72. So when I say it's never too late, I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the third, it, and both of those were audacious moves. I will tell you Absolutely. that, you know, it took courage. About four years ago, I was furloughed. I had been the executive director of a nonprofit for almost 15 years. Mm -hmm. During the pandemic, I was furloughed. And I had to face, like at my age, is anybody going to hire me or should I do something else? So I decided to become a consultant. My thinking is, People will think I'm smart because of the color of my hair, and maybe they'll pay me. Okay. But I didn't know how to start. So what I did is when I was running the nonprofit, I had a board of directors. And I went to several people and I said, look, I said, I'm thinking of getting into this business, but I don't want to make a mistake. Could I do some pro bono consulting for you just to stay sharp and to learn the ropes and sure. stuff like that? And a half a dozen of them took me up on it. And I felt great because I was giving back these people that helped me. And then a little without expectation, most of them turned into paying gigs. So I've been a consultant for four years and I haven't ever solicited business. People came to me. I love it. And um, I'm the best boss I've ever had. Make no mistake about that. I, I, I treat myself very well. But I was thinking, you know, when I was talking about like audacious, I didn't realize it. But I guess becoming a consultant was kind of audacious. Yeah, particularly if it's something you never did before. Right. And I, and, and I love the manner in which that you presented it. It's like, hey, can I do this to, to help you? It wasn't thinking about, <laughs> can you do this? Can I do this? Because I know you're going to pay me. That's not the goal at all. You know, the, the thing was, is my thoughts were pure. I owed these, I, you know, I was a big fundraiser. I had a lot of volunteers. I really made a difference in the mission. And these people helped me of their own time. I mean, it was the least I could do right. was, you know, to add my brain power to their business and try to help them. Love it. Be I love before it. I worked for that nonprofit, I was a restaurant executive. Okay many years and i was that restaurant executive who started at a mcdonald's restaurant picking up cigarette butts in the parking lot wow you know and i wow. made it to president of my own restaurant company took a few more decades maybe than i wanted but i still got there yeah well it's on your own timetable right that's the thing in all this that you we do what we do on our own schedule um, what made you wait so long to run that marathon? Like, I mean, was it 70 that you came up with the idea or like, was it something you, you, you put off? Well, um, my wife, when I was 60, suggested that maybe I would be better off if I spent less time on the couch and handed me an article about walking. Okay. So I said, okay. So I get up and I walked. And the next day I did it again and I did it again. And even if it was raining, I made sure to go outside, at least take five steps and come, you know. So I, I had a consecutive walking streak of more than 400 days. Okay. And then one day I said, I wonder what will, what will happen if I ran a bit. So I, I jogged for 100 yards and I was shocked. I, I actually did it. I, I didn't think I could. And so the next day I said, I'm going to go for a run. And I ran a mile and I, and I was, I was like stunned. 
I said, I'm 60 years old. What the hell am I doing with this? And then I started running and running and I entered a 5K and I finished it. And when I was running, I, I on the main street of my town, I was running by younger people who were walking. And it made me feel really cool. And so I just kept running. And then um, I hurt my knee. Okay. I had to go to physical therapy. The physical therapist figured me out quick okay. and started giving me running tips. And then she started her own business and I became her client. She became my running coach. And one day I came to her and I said, I think I could do a 10 K. Okay. And she said, well, it's about time. And I said, okay. And then a little while, a couple of years later, I said, I think I might be interested in a half marathon. Okay. And she said, well, it's about time you said that. And then a couple of years later, I said, I might be able to run a marathon. And she says, well, it's about time. And so my running career consists of dozens of 5Ks, a bunch of 10Ks. I've run six half marathons. And I ran the Boston Marathon in 2020. And you. I have to tell you, it was when I crossed that finish line, the 500 training miles I did before I ran that 26.2 were definitely worth it. Wow. Congratulations. That congratulations. That's, that's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. I would imagine that sense of accomplishment, particularly when that you, you, you do something that you never saw yourself, right? right? You just, you know, you just kind of said, okay, and let's try this thing. And, and, that, and that, again, and that's why I, I love the beauty of just, just try mm -hmm. two words. I love together. Just try. Well, the one thing I think we can do, we can guarantee we can do better than anybody else. Uh -huh. It isn't singing. It isn't dancing. It isn't reading. It isn't writing. The one thing we guarantee we can do better than anybody else is try. Yeah. 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 And I also love the, the, the response from your, your, your coach, right? Like waiting for you. Um, and, and to me, what that really speaks to is the people around us, they have this outside view. And, and and oftentimes they have a better view of our full potential than we do. Yeah. And we can't see the things that they can see for us. And, and oftentimes, you know, you know, like I, I know, like, you know, in, in my family, if I say to my brother, Hey, I'm going to do this. I'll get a very similar response. Like, yeah. And okay, finally, like, what are you waiting on? Right. Right, thing, right. right. Because they see this and they're like, Oh, okay. Well, like what took you so long? And yeah, I had to go through my own journey. I had to go through right. my own process and I had to figure out and muster up the energy and the strength and the courage and all that kind of stuff. But people can't see. And that's why I'm always a big fan. Oh, I know, I know, you know sometimes you hear, you know, don't, don't listen to what the people's things that people say about you. I'm all for the things that people say about me. Like I, I want to know it all, right? The good and the bad. Cause that you, you, you build from the bad. So the criticism yeah. you, you build from that, but the good stuff, that's where your potential lies. Right. So you got to pay attention to that. I think. Right. Right. Someone told me once that the rarest ability of all is to see ability in others. Mm. You know, and that's a really an external focused thing. One of my cliches, going back to what you were just saying, mm -hmm. is feedback is a gift. Yes. And I tell the story. Um, I was responsible for 56 restaurants in Los Angeles and Southern California. Yeah. Okay. We got a new vice president and he decided to tour stores with me. So he went with me. I picked him up. We went around. And on the way back, we stopped at a gas station and I had my Texaco credit card and I had an envelope for receipts and I had my expense report. And we, we pulled out. He said to me, Ed, you know what you do best in your job? I said, what? Get gas. You get gas better than anybody else I've ever worked with. Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't exactly what I wanted to hear, but I, right. I, I I did something. I don't know how I did it, but I gave him permission to give me feedback. Gotcha. And, and, and I acted on it and I responded. And a couple of years later, there was this, he, he took a big job 
based in San Francisco and he brought me with him. Mm. And that kind of launched my executive career because I knew what to do because I had feedback from a mentor and I responded to it and I validated it and I wasn't defensive and it, it really changed my whole life. Mm. I love that. I love that so much. Um, something I gotta ask, I'm dying to know is where did your, where does your optimism come from, Edward? Well, I don't know. I, I have my 50th wedding anniversary coming up. Um, okay. I'm sure that my wife is part of it. Um, <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm, I, I tell people I'm a cliche machine. And one of the famous ones is while the pessimist may be right, the optimist has a better time on the trip, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and I think that I think that when you are optimistic, you you see solutions to problems more than if you're pessimistic. When you're pessimistic and something goes wrong, it just confirms what you were thinking. Mm. But when you're optimistic and something goes wrong, you say, I can figure this out. You know, this is just a bump in the road. Yeah, no, and 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 that's that's a challenge for a lot of people, right? Because look, these bumps in the road, these adversities, these challenges, these struggles, you know, we we all respond differently to them. Like they're going to hit us, and we're all going to react. We're not going to react the same. So, someone who maybe isn't as inclined to be optimistic is like, yeah, easy for you to say, Ed. You don't got my life, right? Yeah. Well, I'm not I'm not here to share all the obstacles that I faced in my life, but I have faced quite a few. Mm -hmm. Um. And I have just found that, well, well, my number one value is mm -hmm. persistence. Nothing takes the place of persistence. Mm -mm. When I was 20 years old, 21, I saw this poster hanging in a restaurant. Yeah. And it was Calvin Coolidge's quote about persistence. Another Massachusetts guy. And I'm going to just read it to you. Yeah. I, I, I wrote it down. So he said, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. So I saw that in my early 20s and I have I have lived a persistent, you're audacious, I'm persistent. I have lived a persistent life. I, I, I can't believe the number of people who give up when they are that far from the finish line. Mm. I just don't give up. It's it, 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 and so I, so I love that absolutely. I think persistence is, is, is a superpower as far as i'm concerned um because it it it, it can produce uh so much um it allows you to see your own personal limits as in terms of your we all you hear that expression breaking point so we all can be stretched allows you to see how far yeah. you can go um it also gives you at least the opportunity to succeed versus you know i'm, I'm at the finish line this far away and i stop because i'm tired or whatever it is yeah, right, and, right. and and i and, and, and you're right like i think there's you know far too many individuals sort of just say, okay, you know what? I'm, 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 I'm satisfied with this and I'll give up or I'll stop or whatever. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's the unfortunate side of, of, of life sometimes where people give up when they are close to success. Yeah. One of the metaphors I use is this. If, if you were with a family member and they were sick and you brought them to the hospital and the hospital was closed what would you do? Would you shrug your shoulders and go? No, you'd go to the next hospital. And right. if that was closed, what would you do? You would keep going. You, and that's, mm -hmm. to me, a great metaphor for persistence is Absolutely. not giving up. Okay. So so we, we were just talking a little bit about people who are naturally inclined to be optimistic or naturally inclined to be persistent. Um, for those that it's a bit more built into them, you know, they're like, let's do this kind of a thing. For those who don't have that natural ability, how do you develop that, or, or what kind of things can you do to develop that? I think you. I think the most essential ingredient is a mirror. I think you got to look in the mirror, and that person 
is responsible for the person in the mirror. Mm. Um, you know, one of the things my mom said to me um, several years ago is I was telling her about what I was doing and I was, you know, this was my schedule and this is da 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 da. And she looks at me and she was in her 90s at the time and she said, You lead a very interesting life <laughs> and it's all your fault. <laughs> I love and that. I realized she was right. Because what what sometimes we we rely on our boss to motivate us. Mm -hmm. We rely on external factors instead of taking charge and feeling responsible for what happens to us. Even if, you know, even if you were in a in a fender bender, mm -hmm. you know, because someone hit you, well, now you got to figure out what to now it's your real you know, responsibility. So yep. to, go, to kind of go back to your question, when I found, and remember, I have gray hair, so I've been around a while. I have found that people who don't take responsibility for themselves are the people that don't succeed. Hmm. I mean, you know, one of the things, because I've been teaching supervisors for a long time, mm -hmm. I talk to employees and I say, do you realize how much of your success depends on your boss giving you the right direction? Right. And if they give you the wrong direction, you don't succeed. You have to take control of part of your direction, at least the trajectory. Yes. Um, yeah. One of the best compliments I ever received is I had an employee come up to me and say, how can you continue to work for that jerk? And I thought about that and I can work for a jerk because I'm, you know, I'm taking control of what I'm doing. I can, you know, I'm not universal in that regard, but, sure. and I would rather work for a, a good leader, but mm -hmm. I've been on both sides of that street. And, and, and there is something to be said for being very clear on what you want out of the thing that you're doing. So if your goal or your, your end uh, you know, the end product that you're looking at is bigger than what you have in front of you. You're not even seeing this because the thing that you're looking at is much bigger, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I just, I just did a workshop and one of the statistics I quoted, I'm not sure where it came from, but the statistic was 3% of people set goals. Okay. <laughs> I can kind of, you know, validate that. Can you yeah. imagine how setting a goal can set you apart? Mm. You know, I didn't I didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to run a marathon. <laughs> right. You know, and but I will tell you on that process, I wasn't really going to run a marathon until I told somebody I was going to run a marathon. Yes. You know, it was part of that that goal setting process. So mm. going back to your question, I think if you are if you set goals and you're persistent, I think a lot of things fall into place, whether you're a optimist or a pessimist, right. setting goals and being persistent. I love it. I love it. Now, now uh, uh, you sort of wrote your memoir is uh, the observations at the, at the speed of life. Um, and it's just a collection of uh, guess, stories from your life and things that you've, you've experienced and lessons you learn. And I think what, what I find really fascinating is that it was, it was sort of skimming through uh, the you know the the premise of the book is just the the collection of stories one, and it, it probably looks like you've had a dozen different careers. <laughs> maybe, maybe <laughs> and yeah, I I haven't added them up, but I will tell you that yeah, a dozen different careers is probably accurate because I've been a very active volunteer. Mm. Some of my stories are about are about volunteering. Um. But as I said, I started in the restaurant business. Okay. Um, but I was always, I, I wasn't just learning to direct that cook. I was trying to learn how to effectively direct people. Okay. And so what I got out of it was kind of a, a knowledge or a skill base that was transferable. Okay. And so that when I went from restaurant executive to nonprofit executive director, yep. I had a whole bucket that I took with me. And in fact, 
I had turned down a position as a chief financial officer. Well, you know, so I, I took a lot of pride, like Da Vinci or Michelangelo, you know, sculpting, painting. I, that's who I wanted to be, I guess. I wanted to be someone who was good at more than one thing. Yeah. The interesting thing about the book is it didn't start out to be a book. In fact, it started out when email was invented. Okay. When email was invented, I decided that once a week for the people that worked in my team, I was going to send one email every Friday. I called it the Friday update okay. and it would have reminders in it, new things coming, some calendar scheduling, just details. But at the end of it, I put something in there I called the commentary and it would be like a, an opinion, an article, a news, you know, a story that had a message that I thought would benefit them. Um, and so for 20 years, I wrote these emails. I wrote a commentary. And then when I was furloughed, I was afraid the world would forget me. Mm -hmm. And so I took all of my contacts, I put them into a master list and I started something I call the Wednesday web log. Okay. And every Wednesday at four o'clock, I send out another story. And the first year I just modified that two decades of commentaries and made them more generic. And then I started writing specific stories. And my, for example, the story about me running a marathon not only went to my subscribers, but since I post them on social media, thousands of people have, you know, read that. Love it. Um, and the stories really range. Like when I was 10 years old, I took over a paper route. People used to get physical papers in those days. And the did. kid who turned it over to me knew the route just work with me one day and the next day I had to do it myself. I took a long time. It got dark. I wasn't sure I delivered the right papers. Hmm. I was in trouble. So I told my dad, and I don't know if people know what mimeograph is, but before copiers, there was this smelly yes. thing called the mimeograph. Mm -hmm. And I gave every one of my customers my name, address, and phone number. And I promised to deliver the paper on time and it would be dry. And my father had me deliver that to every single customer. Mm. Well, guess what? At 10 years old, I knew more about accountability than a yes. lot of people <laughs> that I know today. And so the stories are like that. They're mm. stories of I shared an experience, something happened, and there's there's a lesson in every story. Absolutely. So what I did is I took 60 of the most popular stories and i put them in a book and they were kinds of observations at the speed of life mm. i'll well, tell you the no go ahead the first story in there yep. is during the one of the during my college when i was a summer during college okay. i worked in a shipyard mm -hmm. near my house as a pipe fitter third class unskilled. Okay. That was my official title. Now you want to help someone's self-esteem, you call them third class unskilled and it works. <clears throat> and the Vietnam War is going on. This is a Navy ship we're working on. And my leader showed me how to not do anything for 40 hours a week. Gotcha. It really stuck in my mind. Gotcha. And I and my the lesson at the end of the story is what really counts is what you do when no one is looking. Mm. It isn't getting caught. It's what you do when no one is looking. That's right. So that's right. That's an example of what's in the book. And 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 was the goal to be an author to write a, a publisher of memoirs? Where was that? Was that something no, you decided I, to after, no. so after you did the marathon? And you said, ah, we'll write the book now. No, my original my original uh, goal was to be a sports writer. Okay. Um, when I was in 
when I was in college, um, I went to the, you know, the daily newspaper for the college. And I said, I, I'd like to be a sports writer. Well, I was also on the freshman soccer team. Okay. So the editor said, you want to cover soccer? I said, okay. And so the soccer team played on Tuesday and Friday. And on Monday, I wrote, there's a game tomorrow. On Tuesday, I wrote a story that says there's a game today. On Wednesday, I wrote a story yesterday's game on yeah. Thursday. And so for five days a week, I was in the, I was in the newspaper. Got you. And the coach said to me, he says, I don't know if you can play soccer, but you can certainly write. And, and what happened was the attendance at these games went from a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand. Wow. Well, when I was a sophomore, I was eligible to play varsity, mm -hmm. but the newspaper and the coach didn't want anything to change. Right. And so the way it worked is when I, when I did something right, mm -hmm. there was no byline. Okay. But if, you know, other people were stars, then I put my byline in. And on road trips, on the way back, mm -hmm. I'd sit in the back and I'd write the story and the guys would come in and say, now describe my shot as a blue dart. <laughs> or, you know, and so, right. so I, and attendance kept growing, you know sure. what I mean? And, and so... I wanted to be a sports writer, but I decided to get married instead when I got out of school. Well, but different. that was the last time I was I was published. So it was, you know, yeah. almost 50 years between publication. Well, well I, I, I do think it's awesome the way you uh, harvested this, the lessons in these stories. So they're not just stories. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and why that's so incredible is that you're giving people gifts, right? And you're actually giving something that matters and that they can take from and maybe even apply uh, to their own lives. Now, I, I, I got to tell you, Ed, you know, um, uh, uh, um, be, being, being a basketball guy myself, um, you know, I saw, I, I saw that reference to Larry Bird. Uh, and, I, and I said, I, I got, I got to ask you about what that experience was like. Okay. So at the time um, I was responsible for McDonald's restaurant across the street from Fenway Park in Boston. Okay. It was so close that when they played the national anthem, we could hear it and I would send everybody on break. Okay. So Larry was a rookie with the with the Celtics and had signed a deal with McDonald's, and this was going to be his very first commercial. Okay. And so we shut the we shut the store down at four o'clock. This Winnebago pulled up that was Larry. The restaurant got filled with all these hangers honors. You know, sure. all these people who want, and it was take after take after take. And it was the invention of the McChicken sandwich. It was the first McChicken sandwich. And okay. McDonald's have been trying to get into the chicken business for decades. Gotcha. So we, we'd we make a tray of 12 chicken sandwiches. And the first tray, we make them, we made them like they were supposed to be made. But the sauce that was on it meant every time he squeezed it, the chicken <laughs> shot out <laughs> right so he probably took a bite of five dozen chicken sandwiches cold that had no sauce on it during the commercial because one of the guys in the commercial was just didn't do it right so at the end of the commercial he crumples up the bag throws it off the menu board it bounces off a post and then there's a five-year-old kid holding open the trash and the and the bag went right into the trash. I love it. And that was the start of the whole Michael Jordan, Larry Bird thing. <laughs> well, the message in the story, it's an interesting story, but the message in the story was, is once all these hangers on cleared out, because this yep. we didn't finish till four in the morning. Gotcha. So they all went home about 11 o'clock and Larry Bird stopped going to the Winnebago and sat around with us and the the extras were all restaurant employees. So he just sat around shooting the breeze with us. Mm. And then the union film crew needed a break. So we cooked real McChicken sandwiches the way you were supposed to. Right. And when I went around, Larry Bird took one. And he was getting paid and he was gonna, you know, 
So that's my all nighter with Larry Bird story. I love it. I love it. I do remember that commercial with him and Michael Jordan, where they're like off the shot clock, out the backboard. All right. And, and I so, was there when that started. I love it. I love it. <laughs> and I gotta tell you, man, I really, I really appreciate it. Uh, and and have tremendous respect for the for the journey. Um, the appreciation that you appreciation that you 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 have for life. Um the persistence is a big one for me as well. And I am, I'm with you wholeheartedly. And then, and then to take all of that and put it in your own book to share with others, to give those others the lessons is incredible. And so, um, uh, thank, thank you for, for all your work. Congratulations on the stuff that you've done, um, for, for listeners that wanted to connect with you or learn more about you or, uh, you know, even your book, where, where could we send them? So if you want the book, it's on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's also on uh, Apple iTunes. You can get a digital book. Um, my company is Ambrose Landon. Okay. So AmbroseLandon.com will take you to my consulting webpage. Um, or you can um, uh, just reach out. And 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 just for, for Ambrose Landon, what, what uh, kind of consulting work do you do, or what what do you what is it that you focus on? So I do, uh, I, I do three things. I do leadership development, mm -hmm. strategic planning, and human resources. Okay. And I do that because uh, I told you the color of my hair is my ticket into, <laughs> into these companies. And I've seen so much that, you know, one of the, one of the cliches I tell people is you weren't around when I made all my mistakes. Uh, you know, so, so that's what I do. I love it. I love it. Edward, this has been really a phenomenal time. I really enjoyed the time we had chatting. And thank you again for, for spending the time here. Congratulations, congratulations, like I said before, and all the success. And uh, keep up the great work, my friend. Thanks for being audacious. I'll see you later. Take care. You know, back we are on the podcast and Edward's stories are absolutely fantastic. And, you know, when you think about our conversation, it really highlights how our willingness to persevere through challenges and setbacks is a key to achieving our dreams and living a fulfilling life. Listeners are encouraged to connect with Edward directly for further guidance and inspiration. Contact details, of course, can be found in the show notes below. Um, Edward is offering a, a special coaching package for listeners of the Audacious Living Podcast, really designed to help uh, set get really individuals on that audacious path um, as well his book is something you also can pick up and I encourage you to check that out thank you for tuning into the audacious living podcast if you enjoyed the episode please like follow subscribe and share to help our podcast grow and reach even more listeners remember your audacious life is waiting for you and all you've got to do is just embrace it until next time stay safe be kind show love to one another and be audacious. You've been listening to the Audacious Living Podcast, hosted by Audley Stevenson. If you enjoyed what you heard, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Until next time, be audacious.